Uh, welcome back. Uh, it sounds like we had some, some good conversations, and I'm happy to hear that. Um, for those of you who are new to this session, welcome. Uh, this is a conference hosted by the Harkin Institute of, of Public Policy. Those of you who are students, um, if you are here in, in search of learning and extra credit, the extra credit sheets are in the back. Uh, the learning will be up here. Um, or, or not. Or not. Uh, uh, our next presenter is Scott McClurg of Southern Illinois University. Uh, Scott's a, an associate professor of, of political science at SIU. Um, Scott's work uh, focuses on uh, a lot of different topics. Um, if, if Joanne is something of a, a political psychologist, Scott has something of a. <laughs> <laughs> if Joanne is a uh, political psychologist, Scott draws a little bit more on uh, social networks uh, and, and, and sociology. Um, and and I, I think this is paired. Th that was not the title Scott gave me originally. Um, it, it does read as, as something of a response to Joanne, which uh, I don't think we necessarily, maybe Scott intended. No. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that I know a lot of you are live tweeting, which is wonderful. Um, some of the more responsible members of the audience are live tweeting, I believe, with the hashtag uh, IAPolitics. Some of the less responsible members of the audience uh, are, ha are tweeting with the hashtag uh, CornStars. Um, so you can follow either of those to see uh, what's going on. <laughs> I will let the masses uh, decide which are the appropriate uh, uh, hashtags. But Scott, um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Um, first of all, let me thank everybody for uh, coming today. Um, it's always nice to see uh, my political science friends uh, and to see, meet some new people. And for the students that are here, um, I'm, I'm either happy to see you or I'm apologetic that you have to listen to this. Um, we'll see which one uh, holds. Um, so uh, in Dave's uh, uh, introduction, he really talks about my, uh, mentioned my work on social networks. Um, which is, in some sense, really the most interesting thing I do. Um, but this paper is actually going to be talking about something completely different. Um, uh, this research is going to be a little different. Um, I'm really interested, or have been very interested, in the relationship between turnout and uh, in participation generally and vote outcomes. Right, um, and there's a lot of sort of speculation I think that goes on uh, around trying to figure out whether or not. Turnout deviations, things that move from year to year, county to county, state to state, whether or not they actually change the outcome uh, or not. Okay, um, and so what I'm really going to try and focus in on today is get some sense. Okay, and as it turns out, it's not easy to get a very good sense or a very precise sense, um, at, at least not for me, um, about exactly what that connection is. Um, so, where they st I was really motivated at, at, at the beginning with this um, in thinking about sort of real things in politics. Um, I got my PhD around, around the time, uh, about 2000 or so, um, and right around that time we had a marked increase in voter turnout in p presidential elections. Um, you know, we'd been ho hovering in the 80s and 90s around about half the electorate uh, was interested in participating. And then all of a sudden, in the 2000s, we started to get much, much higher t turnout. Um, when I mean higher, I mean, you know, four or five points higher, not, you know, like everybody all, uh, all of a sudden started to participate. Um, and, you know, I was concerned or and interested in the uh, consequences of this. Um, there's also been some really uh, significant changes in the ways that uh, campaigns work. Um, so I'll give a, a plug to one of our speakers coming up later on this evening. Sasha Eisenberg has written a book called The L Victory Lab that documents a lot of the most recent changes. Um, but we really went from being, you know, generally speaking, uh, national campaigns that were really national in nature to much more localized uh, campaigns. So the last time the campaign spent a s significant amount of money on, um, for instance, national broadcast media, not local commercial time, but, you know, buying it, you know, during 6 o'clock on NBC News and whatnot, was 1988. Um, you know, I guess Bush did a little of that in 1992, and the Clinton campaign 
innovated this and said, no, let's go buy local markets. Let's not waste our time with everybody we, you know, in places that they're already gonna, we're already going to win. Um, and so we've had that. We've also had more recently, and this is the stuff that uh, Sasha's work touches on, uh, the rise of what we call big data. Um, um, and basically, there is, you know, for the students, this may come as a surprise, we, you know, there are companies, companies out there that know everything about you. And, I mean, everything about you. And it's their whole job is to, you know, uh, watch your, your purchases, to uh, see what kinds of ma magazines you subscribe to, um, how much public information you make on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and advertisers have been using this data for a really long time to um, make inroads and in trying to be more efficient and uh, more persuasive with their advertising uh, strategies. Um, political campaigns were a little slow to adapt this, but they have, and, and you know, so we saw the rise really in uh, 2004, 2008 of uh, you know micro targeting, um, where you and your and your neighbor might be getting uh, mail from the same campaign, but it may be saying something completely different based on your personal characteristics, what they can mine out of these big data, and then. Finally, uh, and, and Joanne's work actually speaks to this a little bit, we've seen some changes in the way that they make and shape their messages. Um, you know, so if you go and you compare some of the advertising from the early parts of the uh, 20th century to you know, more contemporary campaigns, you'll see that there's been change in the language um, uh, of, of all this. All right, so we have this really suspicious, I guess, um, increase in turnout, and we've seen these big differences in campaigns, and so I'm kind of interested in all that. All right, well, at the same, right, at the same time, we also have this, this is all very much in the background from campaigns, we've seen this incredible polarization of elites in Congress and the Senate, and, and really, to some degree, the, um, uh, the presidency as well. Um, at the same time, if you look at uh, national election data, there's actually fewer people who claim to be partisans over time, okay? Um, so what we see is politicians being more political, m farther apart, and citizens going the other direction. And it's kind of a puzzle in, in some ways. Um, but underlying all that, there's actually uh, a, there's a, a, another trend, which is that more people call themselves independents, but they still harbor partisan uh, feelings. So, you know, the way that we do this as political scientists, we ask them, are you an independent Democrat or what? They say, I'm an independent, and we say, but do you lean to one party or the other? And, the, you know, a significant uh, number of people now call themselves uh, leaners uh, for one pay, uh, party or the other. Um, and so what we have is this giant poll of people who have not become more partisan, um, they're a little bit more ambivalent about their partisanship, but these polarized campaigns and politicians are now having to reach out to them and sort of keep them uh, um, on the plane, on the reservation, basically. You know, these are people who have, you know, a predilection, but they don't necessarily express it all the time. So they have to be reminded all the time when it's time to go vote that, uh, um, you know, they should vote for the, that predilection. And these are also people that the other side looks at and says, well, maybe we can wedge in there with a wedge, wedge issue, issue of some kind or something like that. So when you put this all together, um, it does raise some interesting questions, I think, uh, research-wise um, for people like me, um, which is, first of all, what is the relationship between turnout and voting, particularly in the 2000s? Okay, we know something about this in previous elections. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but it's something changed, uh, particularly with these more sophisticated campaigns that are going after part partisans who are, you know, basically in the closet in some sense. And then uh, to what degree is this a consequence of mobilization rather than persuasion? So when we see these upticks in uh, um, uh, turnout, are we seeing new voters or are we seeing these, you know, sort of, people are half in, half out of the political system, and they're the ones that are being tapped on uh, all the time. Um, and one way to think about this is that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, newspaper reports, and again, exempting the, the journalists in the off audience, because you guys are great, you all do your job wonderfully. Um, 
But, uh, you know, we always talk about how important the independents are. Um, well, the truth is, from a political science point of view, there aren't a whole lot of independents. There are people that, you know, might not tell you who they're going to vote for, but they, they harbor these pre predilections. Um, and are we really getting new people involved in the process, which is what a political scientist is mostly interested in, or are what we're doing is just kind of bringing them out of the closet temporarily, and then they go back and, you know, politics goes on as uh, uh, always. So um, what do we already know about this? So I'm going to take Joanne's tack and not give you too much of the research uh, literature here, um, which the students should be very thankful for. Um, I expect, you know, handshakes and everything afterwards from you guys. Um, so the old campaign adage, okay, this is one of these pearls of wisdom that's been passed down for years, is that um, Democrats benefit from uh, high turnout uh, elections. And you'll still hear con consultants talk about this all the time. And there's a, there's a sensible logic here, which is right now the de uh, Democratic Party has more low-income voters, more le or less educated voters, um, you know, voters that are in unions and, you know, lower status um, occupations. Um, all these research, uh, resources that Joanne was talking about a little while ago, there's more people who sort of lean Democratic that aren't likely to participate because they don't have the resources. And, and so based on that, they said, well, you know, Democratic consultants for a long time thought, well, if we can, you know, increase turn out, turnout, we'll win. Okay, so higher turnout means more Democratic victories. Well, political scientists, being the nudges that they are, uh, wanted to figure out if that was actually true. Okay, we don't just always take things at face value. Um, and we've garnered a couple of different uh, things from uh, uh, the literature here. Um, there, are, there are, in fact, more what I, I, I've labeled as latent, unmotor, unmobilized supporters for Democrats. Um, so we do know that, uh, in fact, John Sides has done some work uh, along, this, along, these line, uh, along these lines. We do know that if everybody voted, it would help Democrats, okay? Um, it wouldn't always make them win. That's important, okay? But it would, in fact, help them. But when it comes to actually looking at the relationship between turnout and the actual outcome of a, of a race, the number of votes uh, that the Democrats get, uh, you get very mixed re results, Okay, I mean, it's all, it just doesn't really matter what kind of race you're looking at. Um, there's no consistent patterns. Sometimes it seems to help Democrats. Sometimes it seems to help Republicans. Sometimes it doesn't seem to help anybody at all. All right. Well, the main theoretical insight that has come from this, um, which unfortunately I can't really resolve, and I'll explain that in a little bit, is that turnout is not, or these turnout effects really, are not just a function of new voters or people being brought into the electorate that weren't uh, previously part of it. Uh, that in fact, part of what's going on here is uh, what's a, a party loyalty effect. So um, just because you lean Democratic or just because you lean Republican doesn't mean that you're going to vote that way if you go and vote. Okay, um, you can imagine, for instance, in this last election, um, people in Todd, in Missouri, uh, Republicans, not wanting Todd Aiken to represent them, so they still go out and, and vote, but maybe they vote for a third-party candidate or they vote for Claire McCaskill because they don't want the party brand, um, you know, uh, to be tarnished by his uh, legitimate rate r remarks. Okay, that's just an example, right? So. Just because people are turning out doesn't mean that they're necessarily turning out for uh, a party. And that over time, these party lo loyalty effects and these uh, mo voter mobilization effects are kind of hard to uh, separate and have a lot to do with when we would expect one over the other. Okay, so that actually kind of makes it hard to answer that question. But that's only one, uh, one uh, complication. There's another one, okay, and it's, a, it's really... Um, inside pool political science kind of one. All right, if we can imagine um, all the counties in the U.S., and I use counties here because I'm going to show you county data here in a minute, um, and they have, uh, we have observations from them from one election, then a second election, and we can do this ad infinitum, okay? Uh, we get an observation of what the effect of, or the relationship is between 
Democratic votes or Republican votes and turnout, all right? Well, if we want to understand that relationship between voting and vote choice, okay, how do we define an effect, okay? Is it come from, in this case, if we look first at uh, going down the first uh, uh, column or second column, right, is it from comparing counties to other counters, counties within the context of the same election? Okay, it seems reasonable, right? And, and in fact, that's basically what we've always done. Um, and you can, get a, you can get an estimate of the relationship. You can't separate the loyalty effect from the, the mobilization effect. Um, you need individual level data to do that. And I'll explain at the end of the talk why we don't, still can't really do that. Um, but we can also think about it by looking over time. Right? You most think that there's like a equilibrium or a normal uh, level of turnout for every unit here, every county. And what we can do is how different is this election from the last one or from a whole bunch of previous ones and try and figure that or use that as a way to sort of uh, isolate the effect. Um, there isn't a really good answer to which approach is best, okay? which is a complication. So we have to basically do it both ways and try to figure out what are the different estimates telling us about sort of the boundaries of how important turn turnout is um, for one particular election. Um, so what I've done in this particular paper um, is uh, two different types of analyses, okay? Um, always a, a word to get the crowd warmed up and going, analysis. Um, the, <laughs> the first one is to compare within, a, within election. Okay, can, counties to other counties, all right? Now, the nice thing that you can do here is you can actually sort of predict um, uh, what turnout is going to be in a county based on its demographics. It's one of the very nice things about sort of the research, resource theory is that, you know, the more high, high income, better educated people are in a county, the more likely you're gonna see more people vote. Um, not just because the high income uh, highly educated people there, but there's probably a contextual effect. They probably bring all their neighbors along as well. Okay, so this isn't just about individual ind individuals. It's really a trait of the, the counties. I've been I call that the structural effect. It's what we would expect any time, just given the basic um, ideas uh, or the, what we already know about turnout. And then we can use that and compare it to what actually happened and say, Whatever is different from that structural effect, the, what we know from theory, is probably a, an effect of mobilization, okay? And then we can compare that. Uh, it captures both loyalty and mo mobilization. Um, and we can then see what's the relationship between that and um, uh, voting in these counties. But then we can also do cross-electoral, okay, inter-electoral uh, analyses here. And what I'm going to do here, I haven't uh, actually gone through and done all the um, uh, averaged across a bunch of uh, uh, particular elections, um, not the least of which is the data is kind of very messy uh, at times, and it's hard to understand whether you're seeing changes that are because the data is messy or because, you know, there, there's nothing to find. Um, so what I've been doing is doing it, comparing one election to the last election, okay, just thinking, you know, when we see how different turnout is in this county versus the last election, and we see also how the uh, vote distribution changes, um, can we get some, can we get some uh, leverage on understanding these vote effects that way? All right. Um, real briefly, uh, uh, most of my data here, all the political data is at the county level. Um, uh, and I have results from 2004, uh, 8, and 12, or 12, not 10. Um, all of the census data, or all the uh, socioeconomic data I'm going to use comes from the census. Um, uh, and obviously, there's problems there. Uh, for the academics, it's a basic uh, mixed effects model with random uh, state intercepts. Uh, this should get, soak up a lot of the variance from campaigns and, and things like that. Um, although certainly it could be improved, I don't, I don't know. So there's some things to keep in mind, okay? I'm making a lot of leaps here with these data and what they say. Um, first of all, not all counties are the same, okay? Um, the county I live in has, oh geez, I don't know, maybe you know, 50,000 people or something like that in it. Um, compare that to say um, 
uh, St. Louis County, where I grew up, you know, which has a few million, million people. Um, they are treated the same in these analyses, and they're not the same. Okay, so we're whitewashing over a lot of differences. Um, it doesn't, as it turns out, it doesn't matter that much with what you find, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, I think the other thing here is that, uh, particularly when we're talking about 2004 and 2008, um, in order to estimate turnout, because the counties report number of ballots, okay, uh, and they don't always report number of registrants, so you can't use, you know, turnout as a, uh, a fraction of registrants, you have to use an estimate of what the size of the county is, okay? Well, as it turns out, it matters uh, for 2008 whether or not you're using the 2000 census or the 2010 census because, not surprisingly, people move around. Um, there are some counties that are, you know, growth counties. They get a lot more people, a lot more uh, immigrants over time, uh, migrants, I'm sorry, um, and, uh, you know, there's others that shrink. Uh, and that may have something to do with the dynamics of what's going on here. All right, so there's some, you know, these are some of the so shortcomings of the analysis. All right, so looking first at the cross-country analysis, what do we see here? Um, essentially, every one of these little dots is a county in the United States, okay? Um, and I don't have a couple of states because uh, they report things not as counties but as something else. Um, I think that's just their way of telling the federal government they don't want to cooperate with them. Um, and if you just plot a simple uh, regression line here, this is, the, this is what you see for two, 2012. All right, so what this suggests, just, you know, as a brief uh, eyeball, is that, you know, as turnout gets higher, okay, the Democrats did a little bit better. Okay, fair enough. Um, but... If, uh, you know, I'm trying to suggest things are not that easy, right? In fact, uh, we have lots of reason to believe that structural effects, okay, the, what we would expect from uh, uh, demographics and things like that would actually benefit the Republicans. And then what we want to know is who's really being affected by the mobilization effect. And just by way of reminder, right, there's loyalty stuff going on here too, and we can't really separate that out from um, new voter uh, and, and old voter mobilization kind of effects. All right, so here are the regression estimates. Um, again, the, another word that surely gets everybody excited. Um, uh, and I'll, let me explain them firstly, okay? If you just do the, if you just control for what state you're in, um, and you just do turnout as a uh, function of, uh, or, or Democratic vote as a function of turnout, what you find is there's actually a negative effect. So that first line I just showed you is a little bit of an illusion, okay? There's a lot that's going on state by state by state by state um, that matters here, okay? But this is without anything else in the model, okay? Uh, and so you, you might expect, right, that because some counties are relatively poor, don't have a lot of people who are particularly uh, educated, um, that their turnout is very low, and that these are also places where there will be a lot of Democrats, potentially. All right. So when you, oh, whoops. So when you, um, so when you actually control for those things, and here are the, the basic census data that I controlled for, what we see is uh, a positive effect of turnout. Okay, now what does this mean in substantive terms, all right? If you were to, if you were to um, basically increase turnout in a county by about 10%, you would get about 1.2% more votes for the Democratic candidate, okay? So that's not, that's not a small effect. I mean, that's, you know, I think most campaigns would be pretty happy with that, quite frankly, okay? Um, yeah, this is, again, sort of an inside pool thing. If you compare the estimates over time for the structural component, uh, so this is from 2008 and 2012, um, you see that it's nice, you know, the model does a really nice job in both, both years. Um, and motiv mo mobilization moves around a little bit. And if you actually look at this for other years, it does change its slope, its pattern, its variance. That's where the action is in terms of a, a turnout effect um, is, is in essence what this is saying. Yeah. Yeah. The regression model is what, is what year? Is that multiple years? Um, uh, no, these are year by year. So the previous one? Um, with the COVID. Oh, hold on. 
Yeah, this is just for 2012. This one here? Yeah. So you do the same, uh, uh, the same regression for 2008, uh -huh. and then you predict. So this is basically your prediction from um, just based on uh, the okay. demographics. Okay, okay. 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 I, thanks. I did kind of skip through that. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions about that? I, I don't mean to go quite so fast. Um, all right. So if you do this all the way back, um, this same basic thing here, okay? Um, turn out with the controls, turn out without, without the controls, and you get these estimates. Uh, this is what you get for the 2000s and 2012. Uh, and note, there are two estimates here for 2008 because it does matter which census data, census data you use, uh, the older stuff uh, and the, the newer stuff. Um, so, first of all, one message here is that if we just look at the, the straight effect of turnout on Democratic vote, what you find is, generally speaking, Democrats do benefit once you account for state differences, okay? Um, the magnitude does change over time, and I would, you know, hypothesize, I don't have any data to suggest this, but I would hypothesize that ha that has to do with the loyalty of the people who are going to turn out anyway. Sometimes, you know, the Republicans are really enthusiastic about their candidate. Sometimes they're not, uh, and they, they go for the other person, okay, or maybe some of these leaners. When you put in all those controls to get rid of that structural bias there, okay, and you just want to say, what's the impact of mobilization, all right, we get a little bit different uh, uh, story here, okay. Um, First of all, it seems like the Democrats almost always get, uh, and these are always significant for the stats people. Um, it's because they have 3,000 data points, everything's significant. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so the Democrats basically almost always benefit from deviations from this norm, norm uh, uh, or this predicted uh, turnout. Um, so if you can get a county to vote more, um, on average, Democrats are, are going to benefit from that, okay? Now, this may be because um, of loyalty rates, but it also may be because they're getting new voters to the polls, okay? We, we don't, can't tell from this. Um, the other thing to know from here is that there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of differences in that motiv mo mobilization effect over time as well. So we had a huge one in, uh, relatively speaking, in um, uh, 2000, right? So this ends up being... Uh, for every 10% uh, new or yeah higher uh, turnout you had in your county, you get about 3.4 uh, uh, Democratic votes. Okay, that means whatever mobilization was going on, it actually helped you know uh, Democrats by quite a bit. Um, but this is balanced, of course, by the really strong bias uh, for the Republicans in the structural uh, part of the equation. Um, and when you look at the other equation or the other uh, estimates here. Um, we don't see anything quite so strong, okay? And, you know, uh, the, the second highest one is clearly going to be 2008. Uh, depends which estimate you want to believe more than the other. Um, and then 2012 is very similar to that. Now, you know, one, one thing that's sort of interesting about this is you go back and you look at particularly 2008 um, and what the newspapers uh, were saying in, in interpreting the uh, 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 the results after the fact, they said the Obama machine had this huge, you know, effect by bringing in all these new voters and things like that. Well, there was an effect, but, you know, compared to, say, 2000, it's not that, not that meaningful uh, based on these uh, uh, estimates. All right. Well, that's, that's one way of going about things, okay? But we also have to think about this comparing the present to the past kind of a, approach. Um, so what this basically shows you is a series of comparisons, this is just descriptive purposes, a series of comparisons um, of turnout in, you know, one particular election in a county to turnout in another election, okay? The lines are there to give you a sense of where the 50% break is in each one, just to make it a little easier to see what's going on here. Um, you know, the, the one thing that sort of stands out to me, okay, is that both, uh, we look at the right-hand uh, corner here. Um, th both that one and the one on the bottom show that there's, you know, sort of higher turnout uh, in counties, generally speaking. Okay, 
Um, and, and we know this because most of these observations, in this case, uh, there's a big shift up of observations up to this uh, quadrant up there. Okay. So these are relatively high turnout elections, um, particularly, I think, uh, with regards to um, uh, 2004, right? But 2008 and 2012 are relatively the same. Okay. Well, if you look at the uh, Democratic vote, okay, um, and in both of the, all these elections, I've thrown out all the uh, others, okay, um, which is potentially questionable, and I can talk about why I did that. Um, you know, you see, you know, basically very similar sort of story um, <clears throat> to, to me, anyway, okay. Um, although up the one top quadrant, we do see that, you know, Obama – uh, you know, they're, they're, he didn't get quite as many of these counties uh, vote as he did previously. All right, so that's just mainly by way of description to give you a sense of what the data look like over time. Okay. So, again, let's just make the very simple um, model first. Put everything on a scatter plot and, uh, and run a reg simple regression line through it. So the bottom axis here is the change in turnout in a county. Okay, from 2008 to 2012. And then going up the y-axis, it's the change in the Democratic vote. Okay, and so if we take this, you know, as, as the, you know, sort of the truth, the, the, you know, the first or a reasonable estimate, what we see is a very slight uh, increase in, uh, uh, that for Democrats, basically, as turnout gets higher. Okay, so if your county was higher in 2000, 12 then in 2008, your county probably, uh, or on average, was likely to have slightly more Democratic vote, percentage of the vote, okay? But again, we're ignoring a lot of things here, so you have to go to the, uh, you have to go to the model, um, and this tells a different uh, story, okay? Particularly for 2008 and two, or to uh, 2012. Um, so the really important thing here is the delta turnout uh, uh, um, number and the first number in each, uh, under each election. Um, according to this estimate, okay, what we see is that uh, turnout didn't, or the change in turnout didn't have a very strong effect uh, in terms of the change in the Democratic vote. Okay? It's there. It's significant. Okay? But it's pretty, pretty small. Yeah. Um, so, in the, if we, if you were to, if you were to change turnout um, by 10 percent, you would get, in this case, a tenth of a percent uh, bump in the Democratic vote. Sorry, I was doing this on the plane yesterday and have time to calculate it all out. Um, right now, this compares to the move from uh, 2004 to 2008, where it was much, much stronger. Okay, and, and then from 2000 to 2004, right? So really by both measures, what, what I'm, I'm seeing here uh, in terms of these, these data and these analyses is really that there is a mobilization effect there, but it's not overwhelming, certainly not in uh, 2012, uh, 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 all right? So going back to the two questions that motivated things uh, for me initially. First of all, um, if we look across these data, it does seem in the, two, in the 2000s that Democrats have, generally speaking, benefited from uh, turnout changes, okay? Uh, the, so the rising tide of vote, voters that have shown up since 2000, give or, or more or less, have helped Democrats, okay? It doesn't, and it's important. It doesn't always mean they win, okay, because there is this loyalty stuff that's going on. Okay, that I can't quite, well, I can't quite, I can't capture it at all, at all, okay, but it has helped Democrats at least stay in the game, if not push them over the top from time to time. Um, one thing that's really interesting that I haven't really got to yet, but I'd love to hear some discussion about this, is why does that affect change from election to election to election, okay? Um, in, so we can think for a minute getting away from some of the obvious things I haven't done here, like model what's going on in the state, uh, or the media market or something like that, and, you know, are, are the campaigns really intense there? Um, but getting past that, there's something different about 
these different elections. Well, we haven't really sat down and thought about this, not in any systematic way that, that I know of. Um, I actually think this is somewhere where gen journalists could really help us maybe um, think about these things a little bit because this is what they do. They talk a lot about how this election is different from this other election. Okay, There's changes in campaigns, there's changes in the mood of the public, there's changes within the parties, there's changes from uh, um, you know, donors. How can we start to model those things to understand these turnout effects a little bit more? Um, and then one thing to sort of I like to caution when, when doing this and myself, and so ergo I assume you guys want the cautionary too, tale as well, is that when we're talking about mobilization a lot, we're usually assuming it's good for democracy. But the campaigns, they don't care, okay? They care about winning. You know, uh, th their definition of what's good for democracy is not getting more people involved and not expanding the conversation necessarily. It's making sure they get more of their supporters involved. Um, and, you know, I think this is something that, uh, again, is maybe not been part of the uh, public conversation here, which is to think about uh, these new campaign techniques as you know, maybe tools of manipulation and not necessarily tools of better democracy and better democratic practice, okay? They are not nonpartisan, and there are nonpartisan groups out there, but they don't have the level of sophistication um, and resources that the campaigns do because, you know, at the end of the day, all they really want is more people involved, and, you know, that's great, and we all like that, but we really like our policies more for funders and campaigners and things like that. And so, you know, this is an important thing to keep in mind when we're trying to study mobilization. Okay? And then, you know, the role of mobilization per se, and this is something that really interests me personally, um, and it's really unclear to me, and you cannot at all with the data I've shown you get at this, okay, but it's really unclear to me how much of this is we're convincing people to stay put, stay with the party versus, you know, changing their mind or using a wedge issue to pull them out of one coalition and into another um, versus really just getting new people uh, into, into the process, okay? You know, in a representative, representative democracy, we're more interested in some sense, and normatively speaking, in getting more people uh, you know, into the process so that the government's policies, the government's uh, laws more accurately reflect um, uh, uh, what the public thinks. This is, Joanne was talking about this in her last slide too, actually. Um, <clears throat> well, it's really unclear whether or not this new mobilization, um, these, these sort of effects and things that are going on because of the new campaigning is contributing to a better democracy or are they potentially compute, uh, can helping us or, or leading us down the path of more polarization? So the vote, voters are not necessarily becoming more partisan, but if we're tweaking them and getting them at the polls because they really need to have that gun rights issue uh, expressed, right? But then they withdraw from the, the, the process, that's not really representative democracy, okay? That strikes me more as a tool of um, uh, propaganda. Um, yeah, and so there are potential uh, uh, implications for government. That's what I have. John? Uh, I'm John Sides from George Washington University. Um, I was tweeting what you were saying more than I was listening to what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> then you're just like my students. <laughs>
On average, yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, no. I let me speculate because I don't have any actual answers to that question. But I do have some speculations. Um, I think one thing uh, that's that's going on here is um, the partisan loyalty sort of stuff going on here. Um, you know, not every Democrat who uh, voted for Obama in 2008 was necessarily just as happy with him in 2012. Um, and we don't really have a sense, uh, and the same thing's true uh, uh, for the Republicans, right? And we don't really have a sense of, speci especially from these data, um, how much these sort of defection rates among party leaders, leaners and weak partisans played out. So that's one thing that's pro I mean, I would assume it's going on. Um, I don't have a sense of the degree. Another thing that, I, that potentially is going on here is that the Republicans got better at their own ground game. Right? They got thumped in uh, 2008 um, after being really good or better than the Democrats in 2004. Um, that, you know, and campaigns do this all the time, right? They see what the other side does and they get better at it. They mimic, you know, really quickly replicate themselves. Um, so I think that's probably going on here as well. And I think there's also, you know, and this is a little bit even more sort of speculative. I, I do think it's also possible that there is a limit to how much you can mobilize the, the electorate. Um, and maybe the Obama campaigns and the Republicans just found all those people in the last couple of cycles. There was nowhere else to go um, at some sense. Um, and so if you think about some of what jo Joanne was saying with regards to interest of people, this is sort of the black box of, of voting behavior. Um, all kinds of people um, don't care one way or you know, one way or another about politics, no matter how, what we tell them and how we beseech them uh, and, and whatnot. Um, there does seem to be sort of a natural limit to how much of the population could actually be mobilized. And you know, it's it's possible that we you know because um, you know we've sort of brought all those people who could be mobilized out of the, the woods. Um, but again, I don't have any data to distinguish b between the the three different possibilities. Yeah. Which may have, it's another way, another complication to think about which voters might have been mobilized in 08 but might have scattered out in 2012. Right. Right, right, right. But unless, I mean, yeah. No, no, I, you're, you're right. That's, a, I mean, it's another, that, that's exactly right. Yes. So the, the broader implication, and, and again, this is something I've said repeatedly, but you can amplify, agree, disagree. I think when you see, it seems to me there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion when we talk about Mm -hmm. um, the counter argument which you've made clear at the outset is what might be happening is that people's votes change. Right? So they voted for you know, Obama in 08 but they voted for Romney in 2012 and vice versa. Now, you know, that's not a large number of people doing that, but it's just enough that it might be different. And so we, it's hard for us to know whether the, the challenge whether the outcome was different because of persuasion changes, loyalty changes, or because of mobilization changes. But my observation Not at all. <laughs> um, let's see here. The, I'm always going to give the students a chance first, and they're sort of back in that corner and over in this corner a little bit. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe in a couple. Uh, Lynn. Okay, uh, I, I have a lot of ideas for you, but I think this is really neat. And I think we can, can, can you get these data going back further? 
Um, potentially. Um, although, I, let me, I would, you, before you go too far, let me reiterate, and Seth will back me up on this. Um, they're very messy. Yeah. I mean, you see there's, can't, you know, I have counties that have turnout of 125%. Uh, something's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's no, there's a lot of measurement error. So, but that said, please. <laughs> yeah, I got rid of a lot of those. I just no. dropped them. <laughs> Two elections, yeah. Right. Okay, so um, hmm. I think that's an interesting pattern that's worth exploring. But given the data you have, can't you take the 2008-2012 data and separate out the battleground counties from the non-battleground counties and assume that the battleground counties are the places where the field offices are located? Um, and if you had really good friends who might even share with you the field office Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if these field offices and the ground campaign are having any effect, we ought to see much bigger, not much bigger coefficients in those areas. Like, do I mean, you can answer this question? Mm -hmm. Can you do it now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, I was, yeah, I was. Gonna, we, I mentioned something to him last night about that. <laughs> um, Okay, well, you know, how much time you get at lunch? <laughs> no, I think that's. I mean, are those? Uh, I think those are. Um, those are great observations, um, um, and and it's all stuff I would like to do with the paper. Um, I'm also so another possibility here is to actually take. There's so this is completely dorky inside pool stuff. Students, bear with me for a second. Um, uh, there's actually also the possibility of clustering spatially of these counties spillover effects that would be completely uh, reasonable to, to look for, and that would be another sort of piece of evidence um, for some of the stories that, that I'm, I'm trying to tell here. And that's that's actually where I wanted to go initially when I. Oh, I see. That was your original interest, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was. Re it was really an. You know. Uh, yeah. My original is. I'd love to learn how to do. You know. Point analysis and. You know. It, Again, really dorky stuff, but you know, and you could actually use that to get a more uh, clear causal estimate too, because if you're not actually targeting this uh, uh, particular county, but the one right next to you, you are. Um, in some sense, it's the the diffusion effect. You might be able to get some handle on ca causal kind of questions. Joanne. And certainly the Republicans think that way.
who are the most mobilizable. It's the people who are just like the high SES, high education people who turn out, who just happen not to be turning out, who are going to respond to the nudge. Right? But they have responded to the nudge them. already. They're, they're not voting. So, uh, an, they're least likely. Another, so I think about, not surprisingly, other than the psychologists, I think about this a little bit differently. Um, I actually think probably where the nudge is going to come from is not the activation of a person, but a network. Uh, surprising, right, that I think this. Um, but, uh, you know, so maybe the people that you can really touch out and or reach out and touch um, effectively are groups like uh, black ch churches. Um, I mean, that's sort of the paradigmatic it's the example people would use, but you know, there's a, a certainly the Republicans did this in uh, 2004 uh, with pretty effectively, I think, uh, or at least they, they thought so, and it seemed effectively. Um, and you know, maybe part of what campaigns could be doing a little bit better, or, or might be doing, and we don't know it, is that they're reaching into people who are in a sort of strategically. Um, place positions within the communi community or the network. And I, they, so you're not just getting their vote, you're also getting them and their, your, their friends' votes and then their friends' friends' votes and their friends' 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 votes, um, which would be kind of, to me, is kind of you know, interesting. Who are those groups? Um, because you know, if you think about the sur suburbs, uh, which are really the high SES, you know, these are not really communities that ha all, always have a lot of social con connections, if you believe um, uh, uh, Eric Oliver's work. Um, whereas maybe in some low SES, um, uh, you know, like a place where I live in, in Franklin County, Illinois, there's a lot of people who go to church and stuff like that. Those are mobilizable groups. Um, and that may be underlying a lot of this, too. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff Patch with the Urban Policy Forty Eight Group. I was wondering if I could talk about what you were saying earlier and, and ask you what you think about the normative conventional wisdom on boosting turnout. Uh, for example, if there was a Republican group uh, interested in a congressional race in a liberal area, if they sent something out to, to voters not targeted by race or anything like that, to low frequency Democratic voters saying, you know, why don't you just take the day off and you know spend time with <laughs> the Democratic candidate, you know, implies there's some corruption there. Do you think that that's always necessarily unethical? Because you pointed to the fact that some some things are just propaganda and get people to vote, but don't really engage them in policy. This is the walking around money thing, and uh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for the students who, who may not know this, uh, there was uh, Ed Gilleps, Gillespie, a uh, Republican uh, consultant, was sort of called unethical for basically paying voters not to go vote. Okay, which is not you can't you can't pay people to vote, but you can pay them not to vote. It's it's very odd. Um, so this is a great this is a great question. Um, is it is it unethical? I don't think it's unethical. Um, you know, uh, you know, we all know the rules of the game, and and you know, and they're not doing anything that you know. And I think we'd be crazy to believe that you know one party does it and not the other. Um, I, like I said, these things replicate really fast. So, you know, just because we haven't caught somebody doing that doesn't mean that it's not happening for Democrats uh, as well. And I just want to be clear about that. Um, but, you know, I don't think that, at least from my perspective, I don't really care about the ethics so much. Um, and I think this is a difference between uh, the motivation of political scientists and academics is that, you know, we've all read you know, Locke and, and Rousseau, or at least we pretend to have read those things, um, you know, and, and have these normative concerns about, you know, what does it make, uh, what makes a good rec representative uh, democracy? And we often judge our results on that basis. Um, you know, so from that kind of a normative basis, if this is really what we think democracy ought to be, um, that's not a good practice. Um, but you know the practice of politics and and the the sort of the the concept of democracy clearly don't match. Uh, if they did, then I wouldn't have a job. Um, and, and you know, does that sort of address that? Or if I could just ask a follow-up. Yeah, please do.
or a system like Australia does, where basically you're mandated to vote, or if you don't, you pay a tax? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so the, I mean, this is a version of sort of Edmund Burke's original argument, where he said, you know, the more educated you are, the more weight you should have. Um, you know, I think. I think what I think doesn't matter because, you know, one man, one vote is very much a, a principle of American democratic politics. Um, and I guess I just a long time ago accepted that that's the way it's going to be. And people have the right to um, express their preferences and we ought to encourage them to do that no matter how uninformed uh, and wrong those preferences may be. Um, you know, and it's kind of a funny argument to make, you know, but that's democracy, right? There, there's never any, there's never any guarantee that the guy in the voting booth next to you knows what he's talking about. Um, in fact, I'm usually convinced they don't. Um, uh, so you know, that's that's uh, as far as rules. Uh, so you know, this is something I was thinking about a little bit with Joanne's talk. Is you know, when we're talking about mo motiv motiv motivation, some countries require you to vote, and if you don't, you get to pay a fine. Um, and that's basically enough for most people to vote. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I wouldn't object if we did that, but you know, knowing America the, the way I think I do, I don't see a lot of Americans going for that. Um, in fact, it, I, it always annoys me my, when my father, well, first of all, my father always annoys me when he talks about politics. Um, but you know, he, and you've all probably seen this at some point where he says something along the lines of, well, if you didn't vote, you can't bitch. You can't complain. Well, no, actually you can, right? What if you don't like any of the choices? Uh, that is an expression. The choice not to vote is in fact a democratic act in many ways. Um, you know, I, I have a student in my class right now that is so conservative that he sees no difference between the two parties and refuses to vote. Um, you know, and I, I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, well, <laughs> it would be t true of a student on the left, uh, <laughs> um, you know. But I, I think that's a you know. So I, I get you know. I think it's better if people don't vote, and I actually think in in a system like that, if you don't vote, you're willing to pay the fine because you really don't like your choices. I think that's an even more meaningful act, uh, and, you know, because if you're willing to pay the price for saying, I don't like any of you people, and I don't like the system, that's a that's a that's an important thing that we probably ought to know um, in a democracy. I'm going I'm to wrap things up because it is uh, lunchtime. Um, and as a general rule, I don't want to keep people from lunch. So <laughs> I want to thank Scott one more time. Thank you. If you are speaking ahead of time, uh, there are box lunches available. One room over to faculty in faculty. Faculty in faculty in faculty in faculty.